Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well and in the mood for a review on a book slightly outside of my normal range of topics, uh, if there even is such a thing. Um, this book is the much beloved 2020 release Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This was a very popular book last year. Uh, among other accolades, it was featured on NPR's Best Books of 2020. I put the audiobook on hold at the library last summer, so yeah, 2020, uh, and I finally got to the front of the hold list after a year of waiting. Now this book already has plenty of dedicated YouTube reviews on it, so should I even bother reviewing it? I don't know, but I'm going to. <laughs> I will say for full disclosure that although I formed my own opinions of this book, some of them strong, as I read, I have watched a few of the many YouTube discussions out there surrounding this book, and I will refer to some in the video as well as providing uh, some links to my favorites in the description area. More than other books, the title of this book pretty much tells you what's coming, uh, which could be part of why it reached such popularity uh, and why it's stuck in my mind as something that I wanted to read. Well, that and the fact that I forgot I had it on hold at the library because um, I wasn't even sure if it was ever going to come in. The book is inspired by classic gothic horror novels like Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, I guess Wuthering Heights, and more. Moreno Garcia herself says in an interview uh, that I've linked below that is worth watching that she wasn't as inspired by the romantic gothics such as Wuthering Heights, uh, but clearly she was drawing at least a little bit from them for the overall atmosphere, uh, since we see Wuthering Heights referred to directly by the main character in this novel. However, in this book, Silvia Moreno Garcia takes these old themes to a fresh new setting of a rural Mexican silver mining town uh, sometime around the mid 1900s. It seems to be a sort of new gothic novel in which the specter of colonialism is overlaid with the traditional dark and gothic themes. In this case, the stewards of the house, in addition to embodying your typical weird and creepy gothic personas and preferences, also hold a certain nostalgia for the good old days of English colonialism, which is an aesthetic choice that in principle works just fine for me, um, but also made me wary of just how overt this message was going to be. So I'm going to break down what I thought of this story in five different dimensions, all of which I had strong opinions about, and some of them quite positive and some quite negative. And these areas will be, first, the overall concept, uh, like how much potential did this book have based on its general premise. Second, the setting, the, the tone and the overall atmosphere of the book. Uh, is this book properly a gothic novel? Is it properly Mexican? Third, what did I think of the characters? Were they interesting? Was it fun to see them interact? Was I able to empathize with them? Fourth, how was the pacing of the novel? Because the plot is a driving force in this book, and beyond just being a gothic novel, it's also at least a little bit of a mystery. So how well did that work? And finally, what about the social themes in this book? Kayla Lattimore of NPR's Fresh Air said, I quote, Silvia Moreno Garcia skillfully weaves themes of class, race, and eugenics into a tale of horror that truly creeped me out. Does this discussion of these topics live up to the hype? I've arranged these topics specifically in an order so that I can hold off on spoilers for quite a while, but I'll let you know when they're coming because I will have to talk about the book as a whole for some of the discussion. Picking up this book, I thought the overall idea behind it was strong and could potentially tackle some really interesting social themes. So I saw great potential. I love this idea of fusing a traditionally European-centered genre of gothic fiction with a Mexican story. And I guess this fusion of cultures and genres is actually something the author is known for in her other novels as well, although I haven't read any of them myself yet. So I really appreciate what the author attempted to do here, and I think it's well worth listening to her podcast interview that I'm linking below, where she further elaborates on this. Furthermore, I thought there was great potential for some insightful social commentary on this post-colonial-ish societal structure that we're seeing in Mexico during the time the book takes place. Uh, but as you know, if you've seen my other reviews, the key here is that I'm really looking for a subtlety and nuance. I think these kinds of themes can be taken on with varying levels of adeptness, ranging from a sort of clunky coverage in which the reader is told how awful is colonialism and everything it embodies, to a more skillful exploration in which the parallels with colonialism might not even be apparent at first, but that insightful readers will begin to infer for ourselves as we place the novel's proceedings within the context of our broader knowledge of history and, well, even the present. Now, I'm going to table that discussion until later, but for its potential, this book got high marks. So next up, how was the setting, the atmosphere, the tone? Is this book a gothic novel? I'm not an expert in gothic fiction, but to that I'm going to have to answer yes. As we ascend into the mountain village of Triunfo, and even further up to the creepy estate called High Place, where it's always foggy and the electricity is intermittent, it evoked the same feelings in me as many of those classic gothic novels. Some reviewers have commented that the atmosphere wasn't really scary enough for them, 
But for me, that's kind of a plus, at least at the start. Like, if you've read Frankenstein, the horror factor in that book comes not from some sort of shock value, uh, but from more the way that everything almost feels normal and believable, and yet, at the same time, something is clearly not normal. Sometimes Mexican Gothic does admittedly go slightly overboard, as was mentioned in a mostly positive review by Holly by Golly Books, uh, which I'll link. We'll, we do see a few cracks in these descriptions right from the start when sometimes the author seems to betray a lack of confidence about whether we're seeing how gothic it is. Specifically, the main character, Noemi, finds herself comparing her experience either to grim fairy tales or to Wuthering Heights, which could backfire if you really liked those novels, and you find yourself comparing your experience of this book to your experience reading those novels, which I did. But we'll get to that in some of the other sections. Furthermore, I think the gothic setting is established well at the start of the book, but becomes weaker as the novel goes on. And a lot of this is because at the beginning of the book we have this open question, as we often do in gothic fiction, to what extent are the mysterious things that we see happening caused by scientific or actually possible phenomena versus being explainable only by something supernatural. And for me, this uncertainty is a huge part of the fun for me in a gothic novel. I'm not going to tell you yet, by the way, which of those is the case, but starting in the second half of the book, the author does start trying to explain everything that's going on in a way that not only is quite complicated, but also for me reduced some of that sense of suspense because things started going from open-ended and unexplained to, well, explained and unsatisfactorily explained at that. Similarly, in the second half of the book, uh, any sense of fear or suspense starts to come less from the unknown and the mysterious and more from shock value and horrifying events, which rather than amplify my unease established in the first half of the novel, made me personally just start to feel a disconnect and care less what was happening. Though this is partly for other reasons that we'll get to in later sections. As for the Mexican setting, it worked for me alright, although Mexican reviews I watched seemed to have mixed feelings about whether they could actually feel Mexico in this narrative. At the very least, I think all the Mexican reviewers I watched would have liked to see a little bit more. Like, why didn't we have any of the characters talking in Spanish at all? I mean, I mean, there were reasons for that described, but still, I think among themselves, I think the Spanish characters might have been more believable if they spoke at least a little bit of casual Spanish. Still, for setting the scene, Moreno Garcia does weave together these traditional gothic tropes with a new Mexican setting inspired by her own travels and research in a way that by and large I appreciate. And all in all, the overall ambiance of the narrative and even this establishment of the house as a metaphor for this dying colonialism fighting with everything it has to hold on were the strongest aspect of the book. Unfortunately, that now brings me to the not-so-strong aspects of the book, beginning with the characters. I'm afraid there wasn't a single character in this book that I found particularly interesting or even convincing as a person. And I say that realizing that the main character, Noemi, is not meant to be really the most likable character. I generally appreciate a wide range of characters ranging from the slightly flawed to the utterly despicable. A lot of this lack comes from the way in which the characters, especially Noemi, are revealed to the readers through dialogue and interactions to me felt dry and inorganic. Most of the conversations between characters felt expository meant to serve the reader rather than the characters themselves. Like, from the very first chapter, we have this conversation between Noemi and her father uh, that feels like an info dump and a plot device, as the two talk about Noemi's life uh, leading up to the present in a way that feels contrived, because Noemi's father already knows all this stuff about her life. So by the end of a few chapters, we've already learned basically everything there is to know about Noemi, and not by seeing it emerge gradually or be demonstrated by the way she reacts to things, but by having her remind herself or other characters in a way that doesn't make sense and is clearly meant for the reader and only the reader. The writing was also not that great at conveying Noemi's personality in a convincing way, and even the aspects of her character that did stand out were often reinforced by needless dialogue or internal reflection. For one example, we're repeatedly told throughout the beginning of the story that Noemi is insistent and she's used to getting whatever she wants. And this is clear from the way that she interacts with other characters and the, the language that she uses, such as, I drive a beautiful Buick, obviously a convertible. Or even her insistence on consorting with this Hugo Duarte guy, whom her father clearly dislikes and has discouraged her from dating, and whom even she knows isn't worth it. And yet all these other characters, and even Noemi herself, keep just telling us this obvious fact through dialogue or internal reflection that says, yes, Noemi always gets what she wants, in a way that, for the reader, just feels way too handholdy. And once I notice this, well, I should as an aside say that I've been doing a lot of editing of my own writing, uh, scientific writing lately, and the editor in me was definitely coming out and just looking for things that could be struck from the text because they were already implied or simply 
don't need to be said. So from early on, I found myself, uh, as I listened, subconsciously catching sentences that told us something that was already obvious and therefore weakened the narrative, and in my opinion should have just been struck out. And I think that this book would have read much cleaner if 25-50% to 50 of the text was just omitted. To be clear, I'm not saying that this novel needed less description of the setting. Uh, there is a lot of descriptive imagery, but for the most part I think the description works just fine. It's the internal monologue and frequent repetition of details that could have been struck because we as the readers can and do figure this stuff out by ourselves. And even the dialogue that was meant purely as dialogue between the characters rather than simply to provide backstory was not always particularly convincing or immersive to me either. For example, the dialogue between Noemi and the villains felt to me kind of childish, like schoolyard trash talk. You know, oh yeah, you incestuous mushroom heads are never going to beat us kind of talk. To be fair, maybe some of this is because the author in her podcast interview describes her view of gothic literature as melodramatic and involving an element of the soap opera, which is a fair and an interesting observation, but it went too far here for my personal liking. But what about the other characters? Even if we overlook the often awkward exposition, the characters still just weren't particularly interesting or believable to me. The most potentially complicated character was this guy named Francis, the only character at the estate who's not instantly cast as a despicable, hardly even human being whom we should immediately hate. No, Francis is a weakling, terrified of his parents and of Noemi and of pretty much everything, except that occasionally he somehow shows these extraordinary bits of defiance and courage. And these personality shifts were abrupt and I know real people do certainly sometimes have multiple aspects of their personality like this, but in this case I just wasn't convinced. I mean, we're told that Francis never strayed from the rules of the house, not once. It would be far too risky because he's too afraid of his mother and the rest of his family. And then on the next page, he almost without thinking lets Noemi take the car out in defiance of his mother's strict orders. I would at least need to see some serious internal conflict here for me to believe this. Now I also have some other issues with the character of Francis, but we'll get back to him in the spoilery section. Maybe most frustrating for me though, even the main character in the Noemi isn't really that interesting. We're often told one thing about her and then shown otherwise, like that she's smart. And she doesn't really grow or develop at all throughout this novel, which is disappointing given that she's the main character. She often seems to embody what another YouTube commentary I watch, I'll link it below, um, referred to as faux feminism, meaning she's clearly meant to be a feminist character, but she does this in such an overt and unnuanced way that it neither feels believable nor effective in conveying a an actual attitude of feminism. You see, Noemi was often saying or thinking these things that to me just didn't feel like something her character would actually be thinking at the time, but were rather something that the author wanted to say about women or about colonialism. These musings were kind of just squeezed into the narrative at places where, in addition to feeling trite, they also didn't feel appropriate for the scene. So it felt like the author and not the character interjecting, and thus it didn't serve its purpose. And it's not that I disagree with the sentiments behind these statements, it's just that they feel very heavy-handed and clunky in the way that they were done. And these aren't the kind of quotes that are going to challenge anyone, they're the ones that often seem like they're there just to attract cheers from the people who already consider themselves feminists to begin with. This might sound a little weird, but I would have liked Noemi much better as a character if she was more obviously unlikable as a person. The way she's written, she comes across as a slightly flawed character, but one who's clearly the good guy and whose flaws are minor and totally outweighed by her positive characteristics. This novel would have been so much fun for me if I could have thought throughout the novel, gosh, this character is such a brat or so painfully stubborn or vain or whatever that I can't possibly like her, and yet I also just can't help but like her because of this, since it makes her seem like a real person. Instead, these character flaws are insinuated, but then, I don't know, it's kind of hard to articulate just what I feel about it, but it just feels like the author is telling us, look, she has these flaws, but forget that for now because you're supposed to like her anyway. I wish the author leaned more into this idea that she's not a likable character and probably won't become one, so let's really explore how that shapes the way she functions and interacts within this mysterious and really overtly hostile environment. But I don't know, maybe she just didn't work for me personally. Did you like Noemi as a character? Leave me a comment if you did, and let me know what about her made her more believable for you, if so. Okay, the fourth thing I want to talk about is the pacing. How does this book work in building suspense, in developing and revealing the inner sort of mystery? This book isn't properly a mystery, of course, but has elements of the genre and that strange things are going on and the reader is kept in suspense with little clues as to what might be going on. Unfortunately, though, I thought the pacing of this book wasn't quite right. 
were told certain things earlier than they should have been told, in my opinion, and then they're repeated over and over again to make sure we noticed, and we did notice. A quick pause here, but I'm going to get into the more serious spoilers now for the rest of this review, so you'll probably want to leave now if you still plan on reading it. One example of an excessively repeated clue is the image of a serpent eating its tail. It's a recurring motif, and most of us will be able to tell long before the characters explain what it is that it's very important and that the author really wants us to be thinking about it, because this family crest is just everywhere, especially in the first half of the book. I myself had already figured it out that it was called the Euroboros before that term was brought up because I was pretty sure this motif was something I'd seen before and wasn't unique to this book, and after it was mentioned the third or fourth time, I just looked it up and found the Wikipedia page about it. Somewhat annoyingly for me, once you know what it stands for, its meaning is a pretty big giveaway. I, although I didn't know the details at this point, it was pretty clear to me after finding this insignia that the patriarch Howard Doyle must somehow be leeching the life or spirit or soul or whatever you want to call it out of this house and its guests. Okay, brief side tangent, I know everyone likes to compare stories to the highly acclaimed movie Get Out, uh, whether or not the comparison is really apt, but this book deserves the comparison, and maybe not in a positive way, because for me, what's happening in the book feels extremely similar to what's happening in that movie, even in the symbolism of racism and colonialism and all that. In any case, though, going back to the main thread, from this point where I learned about the Euroboros, which was very early on in the book, any mystery was more a matter of tying up the details than anything else. And those details were the other aspect of the mystery that just didn't work too well for me. I didn't figure out this fungus symbiosis thing because I thought maybe it was only that Noemi's and Catalina's food was being spiked with psychedelic mushrooms. Really though, if you worked out all the details of what was going on, you somehow cheated because I still haven't figured out the real explanation myself. And it seems like most of the YouTube reviewers I watched were also still genuinely baffled about exact details of what happened here. And I want to be clear, I don't think everything always needs explanation. Like I mentioned before, some of the fun of gothic horror is how it defies explanation. Like, we don't need to know the exact journal articles that Dr. Frankenstein was reading that enabled the scientific breakthrough that allowed him to create his monster. The, the problem for me here in Mexican Gothic is that the author does try to explain some things that maybe should have just been left unexplained. And worse still, she tries to explain it in a way that is complicated, and complicated in a way that feels convenient to the plot rather than convenient to our ability to understand what's going on. For example, there are tinctures that can give you back your free will until it becomes important to the story that you not have free will temporarily. And then there are these symbiotic mushrooms that are impossible to escape from once they've infected you, except if true love's kiss is there to save the day, because isn't that basically what happened with Francis? Okay, though, enough of that. Uh, I, I didn't love the pacing of this book. But now for the fifth and final topic I wanted to discuss, one that in my opinion held much promise, but also held much room for failure. Um, and that is the discussion of complicated social themes such as colonialism, class, race, and eugenics. And I have to say that the discussion of these topics, at least for me, was not good. So Howard, the family patriarch, is supposed to represent colonialism and the patriarchy and pretty much everything else evil in the world, and he does so in a way that is just so unsubtle that it actually was almost making me laugh. Howard is clearly not supposed to be even a mildly relatable or nuanced character whatsoever. He's totally incapable of even disguising himself as a somewhat normal person. I mean, he starts barraging Noemi with questions about theories on racial hierarchies as soon as she arrives at the house. Then in his next conversation with her, he tells her point blank that a woman's function is to preserve the family line. I, I get that he might think these things, and, and people might think these things, but, but who, who actually says such a thing as a matter of conversation on the first time that you're interacting with someone. He's clearly not talking to Noemi at all. He's talking to the readers to make us understand how bad of a guy he is. And to me, this lack of subtlety made me find him less creepy rather than more creepy. This is reinforced in like chapter three or a, a very early chapter in which Noemi, at her first day in the house, walks into Howard's study, I think, and she immediately discovers his eugenics library just sitting there. This really just wrenched me out of the narrative for the next chapter because I thought, this is just such an odd narrative choice not to expose this more gradually. Like, I would have loved for this to be hinted at, but not to be quite clear at first. And then later in the book, Noemi 
realizes what's happening when she stumbles into Howard's study or when she realizes what the Euroboros represents. To me, this was just such a missed opportunity at something that could have worked well if it was a lot more subtle or even just gradually exposed. And I think discussion of eugenics and these other social themes certainly has a place in this book. But focusing for now on the eugenics discussion as a, kind of an example, my problem is that the discussion of this topic is just so shallow, and as a result, it fails to challenge us or force us to grapple with its implications. In the same way, for example, that Roxane Gay, in her essay collection Bad Feminists, criticized the book The Help for, among other things, making its discussion of racial discrimination just too easy for its readers, especially the white readers, this book did not challenge me at all. It was far too easy. Mexican Gothic did not force me to think about how I could be a part of these evils that the author is categorically condemning, or even think deeply about whether or why they are evil. I could technically check off the box for read a book about eugenics in my summer reading program or readathon or whatever without really learning a thing about eugenics from this book other than that it's bad. And unfortunately, I think the way that the topic is presented in this book facilitates this sort of superficial reflection. And in some ways, I even wonder whether this does more harm than good by enabling us readers to mentally distance ourselves from eugenics or colonialism or racism as we malign this caricatured form of it. For example, eugenics is still alive and well today, but it's not as strikingly obvious and easy to recognize as the figure of Howard Doyle in this novel would have you believe. As an aside, I talked a little bit about this topic in my review of the nonfiction book Fatal Invention by Dorothy Roberts, which is a book that I'd highly recommend if you're interested. And to provide a sort of alternative option, I, I would have loved to see a sort of story where we think the whole time that this ridiculous dude Howard is the bad guy, but then as we progress through the novel, we gradually come to learn that the real evil is something within the main character herself, or, or at least within a seemingly decent character like Francis. That would have been a really cool plot. Just thinking back to the classic gothic stories like Jekyll and Hyde or Frankenstein, part of what made these particular stories so timeless and made them resonate with so many people, or at least with me, is that ultimately the evil or the enemy lies within the hero or the anti-hero, and by extension forces us to question whether the enemy lies within ourselves as the readers. But in Mexican Gothic, the bad guy is just some guy who is completely removed from everything else we know and is literally the embodiment of evil rather than an actual human character in his own right. And there's also this one character, Francis, who is supposed to be one of the more complex characters but never really quite lived up to that aspiration. Although it was clear pretty soon that the plot I suggested a moment ago wasn't going to be the real one, I was at least holding out hoping that Francis was going to turn out to be the actual bad guy. I think it would have significantly strengthened the book and given the discussion so much more nuance. Like, just picture it, the real eugenicist or colonialist or whatever you want to call him turns out not to be this obvious evil clown Howard Doyle but rather the oddly charming Francis, who has even good intentions, but lacks the courage to stand up to the powerful structure around him. Now, I do think Francis is probably supposed to represent something like that, a weakling who chooses to cooperate with the system rather than resist it because it's the easy path, but I just don't think that it came across as well as it could have. Partly, this is where the over-explanation of the science, if you will, around what could and couldn't happen, it started to get in the way for me the fungus allegedly basically eradicates your free will, and, and I'm not sure what to think about it, because it suggests that colonialists and racists are basically brainwashed, but to the point where they or we can no longer even be responsible for our choices, I actually can kind of see and appreciate where the author might have been trying to go with this idea of prejudice eating into our minds to the point where it fundamentally changes the way we think, but I just don't know what to make of the way that we even see it messing with Noemi's ability to make her own autonomous decisions. I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more, I guess the way in which the fungus controls its host could be one of the book's more interesting metaphors, even if it leaves a lot open to interpretation. So I guess leave me a comment in the discussion below if you have thoughts about this. What do you think the symbiosis between the fungus and the humans is supposed to say about society? And, and did you notice any of these sort of extensions of the metaphor? Like, for example, how the fungus seemingly alters its host's free will? I'm actually kind of curious now. Still, instead of really reckoning with these complexities, Francis somehow seems to just totally get off the hook by the end of the book. 
even though I and some other reviewers question how is this character supposed to be likable when the only heroic things that he does are the things that are going to help him get a girlfriend. I'm not going to get into that in this review, though. There's a lot of good discussion out there about that already. Okay, I recognize that maybe it sounds here like I'm just too picky in my reading of this, and that is fair, so I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge that a lot of people really liked this book and thought that these metaphors that I'm describing as too obvious actually were genius. But I'm very much a fan of subtlety because as I've said already, and maybe we'll do an entire video on it at some point, I think subtlety makes us think a lot more effectively than preachy sort of messages or overt messages without much nuance. I find Mexican Gothic frustrating because it's very popular and I can see its appeal and it's the type of book that receives a lot of attention, as it should, for its attempt to explore a broader political narrative and to challenge concepts such as colonialism and eugenics. But what's unsettling for me is that so many people are reading it and finding that it does just that, when in my interpretation it feels like a very safe, very easy book for a, a certain target audience, of, of which I'm a member. A book that handles the topics we want it to, but in a way ultimately fails to challenge us as readers. And therefore, if the purpose is to actually influence our thinking about these topics, it fails for me to achieve its purpose. So in case it's not obvious, I didn't really enjoy this book and I can't recommend it. But to end this review on a slightly more positive note, I don't want to be too critical of the author because at the very least, I appreciate her awareness of the genre of gothic fiction and the way in which she sets the tone here, despite my feelings that she needed to go further with the characters themselves to really live up to the genre. I think this book had a lot of potential, but needed first of all more editing for concision and for realistic character dialogue and some further fine-tuning of the way in which the novel explores its broader themes. That's it for Mexican Gothic, though. If you liked this book, please do leave a comment, especially if you can understand my criticisms, but you think I overstated them, or you just didn't find them quite as prominent or bothersome as I did. Now, certainly I am just one reader and looking to see what others thought about it. If you liked this review, or if you hated this review and want to see more reviews that you'll really dislike, don't forget to dislike this video and subscribe, and until next time, Bye, and happy reading.